Hello, welcome, and thanks for dialing in, and thanks for joining Reducing Risk and Fraud in Pension Payments. That's the business that we're in, paying pensions to the right person on time and in full. A huge thank you, uh, before I even turn to my panellists, a huge thank you to Ibri and my pension ID for setting all of this up, for asking me to chair. It's a great honour. And I can say nice things about them because I'm not employed about them, but it, it, employed by them. It seems like they are great people to be tackling this subject of fraud. Ibri have made it their mission, really, to deliver better outcomes to all the members that you, our attendees, have around the world. They are all about paying out securely on time. They do it in over 140 currencies. I can't even name seven currencies. Uh, knowing the local payment networks means no hidden bank charges, not taking money from the pensioners. And though they, they talk about mass payments overseas without reduced or loss payments, I mean, that's the level you can talk about it. But of course, that comes to life when you think about breaking it down into the individual people who are getting the money they rely on without having the deductions and without worrying and without having to chase you, which of course makes their lives easier, makes your lives easier. Um, it seems like a natural partnership with my pension ID, uh, which was set up apparently originally to verify people overseas, but without using the old fashioned, quite tedious paper methods that we've used for, I was gonna say decades, but probably hundreds of years. They fast forwarded the industry, if you like, into the future with biometric technology, with mobile technology, so that your members can confirm who they are and you can confirm who they are in minutes. Now, I, I know that this is all about reducing fraud, but let's remember it's also, sounds like a speedy, easy way for members to do all of the things that will make your lives easier and therefore their pensions more secure, more efficient. So they're gonna be updating their details, controlling their personal data, verifying their identity and all of those things. And of course, our fantastic tools against fraud, which has become a bigger and bigger issue in the industry. And the way that we tackle fraud has come a long way from just the single page, or sometimes not even a whole page, half a page in a newsletter warning people about scams, which is great. And, and there are many schemes that still do those. I know I've, I've written lots of those warnings for member newsletters, but there's more that we need to do. Having these technological, technological solutions for My Pensions ID and eBury are fantastic. And there's more that we can do as an industry because scams is just one corner of the bigger fraud landscape. We have four fantastic panelists. Uh, if they've done nothing else uh, but ask me to, to join, uh, Ebri and My Pensions ID have set up some real big hitters and experts in the field with wonderful experience across a really lovely breadth between them. And it's my delight and joy to introduce them. I'm going to go uh, one by one, but before I do that, I'm going to remind you, the audience, to please ask us questions. We've already, before the session, had a handful of really interesting, insightful, interesting questions uh, come in. So you're already my favorite audience of the day. Uh, please, as we go through, if you have any other thoughts, ideas, questions, pop them in the box. I'm going to keep an eye on it and I will feed as many of them through to the panel as I can as we go along. It's particularly good that this panel has experience and knowledge of the pensions world, but also experience from outside it as well. I think the pensions world can too often be a little bit insular, but the panelists I'm going to go to first brings experience from outside pensions. Professor Keith Brown is a fraud and scams expert. He's a government advisor. He's had a glittering academic career. He's emeritus professor at Bournemouth University. He was awarded the Linda Ammon Memorial Prize for the individual making the greatest contribution to education and training in the UK. That's, it sounds like a pretty heavy hitting award. He was awarded a Charter Trading Standards Institute Institutional Hero Award, recognizing the significance of his research into financial fraud and scams. So there couldn't be a better person to be talking to about this subject. He sits on many advisory panels and boards, including the Home Office Joint Financial Task Force. He's writing an all-party parliamentary report looking at financial fraud within families. And he's 
continuing to lead the national research into the whole area of fraud on behalf of the national scams team at the Chartered Trading and Standards Institute. And when he's not doing all of those things and talking to us, he may well be on a boat sailing or coaching cricket. So thank you for taking a break from all of those things to talk to us. And I've come to you first, Kevin, so that you can give us a quick overview to tell us about the context of fraud and the view from outside pensions and where we sit within that world of fraud. Give us the view of the landscape, please. Welcome. Thank you, Joe. Um, uh, it's a bit, bit unnerving when you call me Kevin, because that's actually my brother's name. I'm Keith. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Not a problem at all. I didn't my mother used to call me Kevin quite a lot. So um, yes, you've always got that many mistakes. So that's why the, a slight nervousness goes on. So welcome, everybody, and, and delighted to be with you all. Um, I guess I really want to start by reminding us all that, that, that fraud is huge. And one of the major problems that we've got in the sector is the underreporting of the crime. We think that only about 5% of fraud is ever reported. So whenever you see data uh, suggesting X hundred millions of pounds or X hundred thousand frauds, my view is you can probably multiply that by 10 or 20. It's huge. Now, perhaps in the pension fraud area, there's probably slightly better reporting because people recognise their pension has been um, uh, uh, taken away and stolen. But many people simply feel foolish, stupid, embarrassed um, and don't report it. So that's the first thing I want to say is we just need to get our heads around the fact there's a huge amount of underreporting. I think the second thing, you know, many of us would have watched Line of Duty uh, recently, the most recent series, and we've got criminals and they keep mentioning OCGs, organised criminal gangs, driving around in white transit vans with shotguns. Well, you know, the truth is organised criminal gangs do not do that anymore. They don't rob banks because banks don't have much money in them anymore. They don't do domestic burglary because we're all stuck at home in lockdown. And uh, they don't steal our cars very often because we've got tracker devices on them. So what they're doing is fraud. And we need to recognise now it's organised criminal gangs. Fraud is funding international terrorism, human trafficking. Some of the worst aspects of humanity is funded through fraud. So we just need to get our heads around that a little bit and recognise the seriousness of it. We're estimating it's something in the order of five to ten billion pounds worth a year to our economy in fraud. A couple of other headline thoughts and figures. Our research suggests that the, the average age of a victim is 75. So it is predominantly the elderly, and in particular, lonely elderly people who are targeted by criminals. You and I and everybody are sick to death of receiving mobile calls, telephone calls, email fraud things, but we normally know how to deal with them. But lonely elderly people, particularly those in the early stages of cognitive decline, dementia, they are the victims that criminals want to uh, attract themselves to. And that's why they buy and sell data, which they call suckers lists, simply because these are the best victims, because they can repeat and repeat and repeat the fraud with them. Just make a little call. I did some research for the government looking at core blocking technology. And this uh, research was looking at the impact of being able to use call blockers to look at people's well-being as a result of it. It was one of the most difficult bits of research I've ever done, simply because many old people, lonely old people, who'd be receiving 20 or 30 or 40 calls from fraudsters a week, they disconnected the, the call blocking technology because suddenly with the call blocking technology, they got no calls per week. And the reality was that many lonely, isolated older people would rather talk to a criminal than talk to nobody. Loneliness is a major issue in our society. And so therefore, whatever campaigns we have to try and stop fraud, take five, better education, better information, my view is until we fundamentally tackle loneliness, we've got a major problem. And the final two points are we do need to also consider the legal systems and legal processes around the way we care for some of the most vulnerable in our society. 
We need to recognize that the term next of kin is meaningless in law. You have no legal rights to care for your loved one, your husband, your wife, your mother, your father, your child, an adult child, without a lasting power of attorney. And there are simply not enough lasting powers of attorney. There's roughly 2 million property affairs registered and 1 million health and welfare uh, LPAs registered in the country. And that creates a legal problem. And actually is one of the reasons why many people kind of circumvent the system and operate on behalf of their loved one. And they often know their loved one's passwords and they have their abilities to move monies around because they're doing it for their husband or their wife, their mother or their father. But they're doing it outside of an appropriate legal framework. So perhaps that's something else we'll come back to. And my final thought linked to that really is we have very, very little understanding of what I would call intrafamiliar fraud, fraud going on from within families. And whenever I'm on TV or on the radio, that's the biggest thing that I get emails about. People describing how mother has been uh, has lost her finances because auntie, uncle, sister, brother, somebody else within the family has taken the money under the assumption that it's going to become theirs anyway by right one day. What we don't know is whether this is a vain attempt to avoid care home fees or inheritance tax. But what we do know is the scale of the problem is much bigger than we recognise. And we do need to do some serious research into that area. Thank you. Thank you. That's a really powerful, sobering way to set the scene so we know what we're, what we're talking about, what we're dealing with here. Let's turn to my next panellist, Joe Derbyshire. Managing Director of the Local, Part Pen Local Pensions Partnership Administration. Uh, she joined in 2019 and she leads the business, keeping up their sector-leading pension admin offering, focusing on more efficient operations for clients, tailored member comms, ironclad data management, and of course, our subject today, risk management. She's held senior roles at major organisations across pensions, including Head of Cooperative Life Planning and Head of Commercial and Strategy at the Cooperative Group. She's also just got a new kitten, but on the other hand, has guns in the house, I assume, because she's told me she's married to a firearms trainer. So reconcile those two if you can. Uh, presumably lesson one in firearms training is don't give the gun to the cat. Uh, Joe, could you uh, introduce your role in a little more detail and tell us how the issues of risk and fraud come up in your day-to-day -day operations. Yes, thank you, Joe. I can certainly tell you that watching line of duty with a trained firearms officer is no fun. Um, what he says, you never make that shot from that distance with that weapon. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Joe Derbyshire. I'm the managing director of Local Pensions Partnership Administration. Um, we are a leading third party pensions administrator providing pensions administration services to local government, police and fire. We are jointly owned by the London Pension Fund Authority and Lancashire County Council. Um, we were the first organisation to join the relatively new Pension Scams Industry Forum. We joined in November 2020. In terms of my contribution to the discussion today, which I'm very much looking forward to, um, we have 17 clients um, across the nine of those are local government, seven fire and one police. Um, we have over 600,000 members, nearly 2,000 employers, and we have 163,000 pensioners that we pay. And each month we pay over 100 million in pension benefits. Um, that's about 85 million in our regular pension payroll and the rest are, are lump sum benefits. Um, so obviously there's a lot of money involved. Um, relevant to the discussion, I think, as well, without boring you with figures, is about 37% of our membership is registered online. So I think it's it's pertinent that we all recognise that digital is not going to be an overnight success or work for everyone. Um, so I, the, there's, there has to be multiple ways that we, we tackle the issues here. And if you think about kind of the, the things where we are, I've got the key risks or the, the major potential for fraud, it's obviously setting up new payments. Um, I'm happy to bring to life some examples of where we've seen people do that. You know, we we had a bigamist who um, sent in multiple marriage certificates and tried to claim spouses and children's pensions. Um, other other ways that we we have risk is around change of bank details, so payments suddenly going from one different account to another. Delays in death notification can be a fraud. Obviously, it can take people 
who are grieving time to notify us or even locate pensions but there will be some people who genuinely do not tell us when somebody's died um, and transfers is another area where we are seeing increasingly sophisticated um, fraud um, some company companies that look very legitimate um, and although we as an industry do much more uh, on that now what I'm seeing in my day-to-day -day job now are some heartbreaking stories of people who transferred years ago when the controls weren't as good and, have, and are left with nothing today. Um, in terms of um, some of the things we do with, with our hosts, then we do partner with Target for our address tracing and mortality screening. The mortality screening is really helpful in giving us that advanced notification of deaths. Um, and in terms of ID verification, we have... Um, towards the end of last year, adopted my pension ID for overseas verification. Um, for our overseas members, our take up's about 23% in terms of overseas members that have chosen to use my pensions ID to verify their identity. Um, so that's, um, I'm happy to um, right. discuss any of those things as we go through the discussion. Yeah, there's lots there that we'll, that we'll pick up as we go through. That's really good. And I'd like to dig in to the detail of that process and the risk at each stage when we get the chance. So thank you, that's fantastic. Uh, but next I'm gonna introduce Andrew Marson, the Head of Pensions Administration at ISEO, who's been in the industry for over 30 years and has a huge breadth and depth of knowledge across private and public sector for both in-house and outsourced managed pension schemes. Uh, and he says the area he loves most is helping pensions admin teams and developing people so they realize their potential make effective improvement to processes and systems to build that financially sustainable service that members value. Andrew, thanks for joining us. I'm gonna ask you the same question that I asked Joe to paint the picture of, to introduce yourself, but also talk about how risk and fraud affects you in your role. Thank you, Joe, and, and good morning, everyone. Yeah, so um, when, when I had the opportunity to, to take part in, in this discussion today, um, I, I really didn't hesitate because um, I make no apology that I, I love pensions administration and, and I know for many it might be seen as a sort of less glamorous role in, in our industry. Um, but for me, I, it's actually the most important because we are effectively, we are, we are safeguarding members' benefits. And that is, you know, that is hugely important to me. And it's, I think as well, another, another angle that we, if we're not careful, we can lose sight of is that we actually, we're helping members through significant life-changing events. Now, and we don't get the opportunity to have lots of contact with, with our members, with our membership. It's, it's only really they come to us at a time when they are already emotionally charged. You know, so it's it's really important that we are able to help them in the best possible way with that. You know, and and we all know when we talk about that, actually, pensions admin is about paying the right amount to the right person at the right time. But in the top, in the context of this discussion, that's, never was it more important. You know, we deal in accuracy, and it's not just accuracy of amounts of benefits, but accuracy of making sure that it's going to the right place going to where it's intended every time. You know, and I think that is where I think you know, pensions administration as, as an industry is, it, it needs to be able to reflect on that more and recognize the increasing responsibility that it is taking care of. And so that is why you know, for today, I, I think it's a hugely important topic and one where we do an awful lot of work, but I think there's room to do more. Fantastic. Thank you. We're going to pick up on a few of those points as well in the in the chat, I'm sure. And our fourth panelist, last but not least, Chris Parrott. Thank you for joining us. Chris is trustee executive at Best Trustees. He's been a professional trustee with Best since April, but he's worked with occupational pensions since 1982 and held senior management roles for a number of UK schemes, including the last 10 years head of pensions for the British Airports authority and he's also a non-executive board director of the pensions management institute completing the quartet of people who really know their stuff chris thanks for joining us i'm going to ask you the same thing again to uh, sketch out anything i've missed out about your your role that's vital but also how risk and fraud 
touched on your life and your position. Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I don't really have an awful lot um, to, to add to what's already been said, because uh, a lot of my experience um, has been already talked about um, similar to, to everybody else. Um, Yes, I've been a professional trustee for the grand period of seven weeks. Um, so put that to one side. Um, as, as Joe has said, for the last 10 years, I've been head of pensions for the British Airports Authority. Uh, and prior to that, I've spent uh, a, the vast majority of my career establishing new, new schemes uh, and operating new schemes, prim primarily for retailers. Uh, the one thing I would say is what has developed over time is that we have become more and more remote with the people that we provide pensions to. Um, active members, your your colleagues, if you if you work in house, you you see them in the staff restaurant, you see them walking past walking past you in corridors, you see them in car parks, or you see them in public transport. You do get the opportunity if if something is wrong with with a colleague um, in relation to pensions or or anything generally. You will generally get stopped and say, oh, there's something going on with Joe or Beryl or Doris or whatever name you want to you want to give to them. And so there's ways of following that up. But as time has progressed, again, the remoteness has increased in that you generally you're, you're paying to pensions, uh, pensions to people you've you've never met. You know, they may be living the other end of the country. They may be living somewhere overseas. So the touch points, if you want to call it that, the touch points that you have with these individuals become very rare. Um, generally, it's at the point where you start to, to pay pensions. Um, and then sadly, at the point where they pass away and you then have to deal with either a spouse or the family in, in wrapping up the, the individual's affairs. Um, it, what happens in between um, and, and some of the things that we, we were told around fraud generally and what's happening in, in, um, in the country or, or just generally worldwide, uh, some of these things were quite shocking to me and I thought I knew it all. Um, but I think, again, the, the issue has become more and more a remote thing and what could we do and what should we be doing to try and help people as much as we can. Fraud will always happen. A, a determined thief will always find a way. But what can we do to minimise those those instances? Um, and yeah, I look forward to, to continuing the discussion. I think I'll stop there. Um, I could go on for, for quite a while, but I think there's a there's a number of very interesting questions we've always already had, and, and I'm sure there'll be others coming through. That's great. Thank you. I, I'm going to pick up on that last point of yours mentioning that a determined thief will always find a way. And earlier, Joe talked about, Joe Derbyshire talked about how sophisticated some of these frauds are becoming. So I'm gonna turn back uh, to, to Keith, if I can, to, to talk to us about <coughs> how sophisticated those frauds have become, what the direction of travel is and, and how far behind we might be. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think, um... It wasn't that many years ago, was it, when standard advice was, you know, look out for the fraud because you can spot the spelling mistake or you can spot the typo. And we need to recognise that, you know, criminals can use spell checkers just as much as we can. And, and the point I was trying to make earlier on about the amount of money and the, the scale of the crime and the types of organisations involved, they use the very best brains available to try and come up with strategies to attack us. And I think the real truth is, unfortunately, is that the amount of money that's spent on what I call offence is much greater than the amount of money we're spending on defence. There is so much profit to be made by criminals that they are really engaging with some very highly sophisticated talent out there to try and come up with new ways to try and defraud us. And that is not going to go away quickly. You know, we have to recognise that criminals recognise that uh, you're unlikely to get caught, particularly if you're working from abroad. And even if you do get caught, the tariff, there's a risk reward tariff here for fraudsters, is nowhere near as high as the risk reward tariff for other crimes. 
So they're piling into this as an area of crime. So it's highly sophisticated. It's extremely well funded using some very sophisticated and highly intelligent brains. I, I wrote a paper called the, um, the, the Psychology of the Use of, of Language. You know, they, they get very clever psychologists and coaches to coach people in how to build relationships and trust. And this is at the bottom of and the background to things like romance fraud that we hear about. You know, these are not just fly by night people. These are highly sophisticated, highly trained people using clever techniques, language and equipment and technology to defraud us. And so we really do need to move away from the thought that actually a victim is a fool or stupid or a bit daft. They're not, they're victims. They're victims of highly sophisticated criminals. I think that's a great, that's a great point. Thank you. And, and what's fascinating to me is that combination of the psycho and analytical or the psychological tool, which we can also combat. And I, I know Quiram does a lot of work on language and building relationship with members to try to keep up with all the ways that a scammer can do it and then bring in the technological in as well so that we're better equipped than fraudsters with the two together it feels like we need to use both to be in the best position that we can uh, i'm going to turn back to my other panelists to talk us through the the chain the life cycle of a pension payment so that we can pick out those points some of which joe mentioned earlier where there's most risk and then following from that how we tackle how we minimize the risk at each of those points so I'll come back to, to Joe first, if that's all right, because you mentioned some of them earlier um, from setting up the payments uh, and transfers. Do you want to just talk a little bit in a bit more detail about what that chain looks like with lots of money going through it and where the risk is and how you're minimising that risk? Yeah, sure, Joe. The, the risk is, as, as was mentioned before, setting up that payment, that first point of setting up the payment is generally the biggest risk. Um, so we will get re re notified of retirements by a different route, particularly for our active members versus our deferred members. So for our active members, that usually comes from the employer. So there's a very low risk that that person's employed. They're in the, there's not a huge amount of, of verification to do there because they're, they're employed by that employer. Um, for the deferreds, it's much more um, challenging because some of them we may not have had contact details with for years. Um, and, and interestingly, you know, technology can also create some issues as well as solve them. Um, we had a case recently where um, an, an old address tracing um, exercise had updated some records in our system. And it was, a, it was a, a, a name that was fairly common. And we sent the retirement farms out to the person who, who was at that address that had been matched electronically. Um, same name, same, um, same date of birth. Um, but when the farms came back in, something just didn't feel right. And it's that whole, you know, overlaying it with a people, people thing. Um, you know, and we certainly uncovered that it wasn't the right, it wasn't the right person who was claiming the benefits. And those kinds of things can can happen. Um, you know, the, the guy I referred to earlier had a had a record of fraud claiming from multiple pension providers and insurance companies um, around sort of fake marriages. Um, and the way we detected that one, um, so this was after the death of a member. Um, the, 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 the documentation he was using to show that he was the legal guardian of the child and they should therefore get a child's pension, the marriage certificate number didn't ma match the marriage certificate that was sent in and the marriage certificate wasn't valid. Um, so th there's so many different kind of angles to fraud that you've got to be you know, all over. Um, and I think the, the whole digital solutions are one thing. You know, my point earlier around less than half our membership is registered online. That's pretty typical in, in our space. Um, so it's, it's all very well for us to adopt best practice being digital stuff. And, and, and I'm, I'm a big advocate of that. But we have to recognise that we won't get everybody there. So our, our backup, our, our, our other processes have to be robust too. Um, I, I typically hear lots of people say things like, um, you know, 84% of the UK population has a smartphone. You know, that's true, you know, but have you ever tried to buy a phone today that's not a smartphone? You know, because you can't buy one. They're all smartphones. 
when you look at the internet usage by age, that, that's very different. So when you look at smartphone usage in over 65s, only half of them use the internet on the smartphone. So th there is something around, you know, got, we have to be careful about thinking that everybody's embracing this digital world and looking through our own lens on things. Um, so that whilst I think digital is, is one answer, it doesn't make up for the fact that you need other, you need a set of checks and good people who are well-trained in terms of picking up those little cues um, for fraud. Um, you know, I'll, I'll touch slightly on the transfers piece, but there was a very sophisticated transfer scheme we scam we saw recently where they they basically pirated the entire livery and look and feel of a legitimate transfer company. And it was only when you start to look at the real details, like the company number at the bottom or the email domain mm. um, where it didn't match the company um, that just, again, set some um, set some we were just worried that it didn't seem legitimate and sure enough further investigation it, it, it wasn't but it was a very elaborate scam how does that compare to to your experience and where you see the biggest risk i'm going to turn to, to andrew next yeah i think they're they're all hugely valuable and and relevant points it's we have we have similar experiences of the and i think for me it's it, it describes i think where Actually, we do an awful lot of work, but the the the, the 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 degree to which we are still vulnerable, I think, is a bit of an unknown. You know, so we do across our industry, we use traditional methods of identification of member by saying send us send us evidence of who you are, you know, like a, a passport, a driving license, and, and evidence of where you live. Um, and when we're asking members to confirm their options or confirm their transactions. You know, we, we are asking for, for signatures and, you know, we're seeing the introduction of, of, of a, a digital signature variance as well. You know, and, and I think that is, that is one line of sight, you know, and it's, and it's absolutely an important thing to do. I, I wonder at times in the current age whether you know, that is perhaps as effective as it used to be and whether or not it just perhaps creates a bit of an illusion of control for us. Um, but then what we do have is the opportunity to, to try and triangulate and grow our confidence that this, this is the right person and it is their right details by you know, accessing data from external third party sources and, and where the, the type of payment needs it. We're seeing certification from an authorised body like an IFA. So all of those I think can contribute to our confidence level. Mm. Um, but it, it's, I, I don't think it's, I don't think we can say that it's 100% watertight. What about, we've had a couple of great questions come in in the chat. One of them, I think, touches on this. Uh, Matthew's asked, to what extent do you think the introduction of confirmation of payee services is, have, is helping, having an effect on protecting us against fraud? Who wants to pick that one up? I'm going to throw that open. Is that something that, that's familiar to you guys? Yeah, I think it's, I'll, I'll come in there. I think it's, um, it's a great system and it's probably helping at the sort of lower level of criminal activity mm. where someone's just trying to put it into their own bank account. The confirmation of pay would show up. But I think as, as, as Joe was hinting earlier, some of the levels of sophistication now is so much so that people will get around that. So they will have the correct confirmation of pay if they really want to be a serious fraud, if that makes sense. So yes, it works. And it's like all these things, they're another level that help, but we're having to constantly build new levels. And I really take Andrew's comments really seriously. We have to be careful that some of our systems don't give us the illusion that actually it's safer than it actually is. And sometimes we don't fully know, but that doesn't mean we must stop. And that doesn't mean we must not use these systems, but we just have to be more realistic about how effective they can or can't be. And I agree with that. It's another layer of protection, but the mere fact that you are paying an amount of money into an account that has the correct name, you have no visibility if somebody is wandering into that bank with a power of attorney and drawing that money out. 
and it's not being used for somebody else. It will work, but it's not the complete answer to everything. But again, it's another layer of helping. And the more layers that we can build in, the greater the protection for individuals will become. But again, it's, it's not the be all and end all, but it's a very, it's a very useful tool. And I, I know, um, well, Joe, you, you've mentioned in previous conversations, you've talked about being a target for uh, things like malware and, and ransomware. And we've had a question in the chat from Diana about cybersecurity loopholes. Uh, how much does that contribute to fraud? I'm going to start with you just because you've mentioned them to me before, but I'll throw it out to the others as well. Um, what do you think of that? I'm sure I'm not alone when I say the thought of ransomware keeps me awake at night as a, as a pensions administrator with a huge sitting on a huge amount of data. Um, you know, what can we do? The things that everybody does, um, you know, we, we partner with experts, you know, we do penetration testing. We, you know, we have good um, business continuity plans and disaster recovery plans. And we do all of those things, um, you know, but the Pentagon gets hacked you know, and at the end of the day, you know, we are running, you know, effectively commercial operations, you know, there is a, there's a limit to what we, you know, what our clients can afford. So, you know, we do have to um, take all that in the round. So we could, you know, it, it, like I say, the Pentagon gets hacked. So um, we, we do what we can, um, but it will never, ever be 100% secure. And you know, the cyber criminals are always one step ahead of you. They're, they're evolving and getting more sophisticated and clever every day. Um, but yeah, it's certainly one of the things that keeps me awake at night. And have you had direct experience of being a target of uh, a, a ransomware or malware attack? No, no um, but other administrators have. Um, so we know it's a, we know our, our, our arena is a target for them. Um, but I'm sure just as, as the other kind of, you know, administrators and people with experience on the on this panel will know, uh, we, we do keep a track of how many people are trying to attack our systems every day. Wow. You know, you know, it's it's significant <laughs> every day, um, you know, partly as well, because our, our group also has an investments business and looks after a significant amount of pension fund assets. Uh, my experience is very similar to Joe um, at, at Heathrow or British Airports Authority, whatever you want to, you want to call it. Um, we launched a website, but we were lucky enough that we could go and speak to our internal IT security because um, Heathrow was attacked a number of times an hour, constantly. Um, we were able to, to lean on them and, and, and ask for their advice. And, and thank God we did, because on the day that we launched the website, we had six attempted hacks. Um, and the website gave links portal into our third party administrator and DC provider. Um, we were lucky to be able to do that. Not everybody has that, that level of, of experience or, and, and colleagues that they can fall back on. Um, I think cybersecurity is a huge issue. And if we are pushing as much as we can online, and I'll stress that as much as we can, I don't think it will be completely digital because it's a generational thing. We need to get through that generational thing. Um, but it's something that is that is going to be a very high level risk for quite some time and may never go away. Yeah. Andrew, from an administration point of view, uh, so for Chris, that's clearly something that, that they thought long and hard about before launching that site and they had uh, an organization they're attached to, which clearly was one of the sort of national targets for cyber attacks, so they could lean on that expertise. From an administration point of view, how much thought do you need to put in ahead of time? How much does it occupy your uh, everyday dealings? How much should it occupy your day-to-day -day dealings and your, and your focus? And how much does it rely on the kind of organization that you're working with? Yeah, I, I think for us, we, you know, we are, it is such a niche area of expertise and sophistication that, that does as pensions administrators, we need to rely on he heavily on our, our platform providers and our own IT security team and our own IT partners. 
um, because it, it is a such a complex area and 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 I'm pleased to say that largely we we don't feel it on a day-to-day basis but in the same context as Chris described you know anecdotally and all of our all of our infrastructures all of our networks are under constant bombardment um, but thankfully in the vast majority of, of situations um, that then that that holds true and and everything's everything stays okay but it is yeah but I, I share Joe's awakeness at night that you know this you, you simply don't want this to happen uh, we've had a little note in the chat from Julian. Thank you, Julian, to say PASO has issued some excellent guidance on cybersecurity aimed specifically at administrators. So I'd encourage everyone to go and have a look at that. Uh, Keith, how, this, this talk about the constant attacks, does that uh, ring true for how much is that representative of what's going on in the wider world as well? Is it six times an hour that this kind of organisation is getting attacked? Oh, it's... Uh... Absolutely right that. I mean, it's, it's like how many telephone calls do we individually get per day saying that our internet's about to go down or that uh, you know, criminals are using massive computers to bombard us with all sorts of things, isn't it? Phone hacking, internet hacking, all sorts of things. And, and I think Joe's comments were particularly pertinent. You know, she runs an organisation and her members can afford to spend a certain amount of money on security but even the Pentagon gets hacked. So, you know, how much money can you spend? The point I was trying to make earlier, there is so much money to be made, the criminals always have more money than we've got to spend on defence. And, and I think all the panellists here are being honest enough to say that, you know, we're doing the best that we can and it seems to be holding out. But the truth is, there are going to be weaknesses, there are going to be problems. And it's why I, I want to come back to some other aspects. We almost have to anticipate that things will go wrong individually, personally, in our own communities and within the whole pension sector. So it's what are our strategies almost to do and to deal with things when they do go wrong? Because I don't believe that we're ever going to be able to rely on the fact we can keep the criminals out forever. It's just not going to happen. There's too much money at stake. I think that's a great point. So perhaps we should we should bring that in about what we do when things do go wrong. But Jill, I want to pick up on the earlier point first, and and also we we've had a little note that touches on this in the chat from from Joe, talking about e-signing and use of MFA with members and third parties. Do you think that should be standard for administrators? I'd like to broaden that out and start the discussion of best practice. What should be standard? Uh, how much do you look around at what other people are doing, and what do you think is the, the the gold standard for the way that everyone in the industry should be operating? Who wants to dive in first? Joe. Yeah, I think we should adopt as much digital, as many digital tools as we can to help. Um, I, I don't think they're a silver bullet, you know, for reasons I've said earlier. I don't I don't think it I think it is a generational issue. I also think it's a, it's an income issue as well, potentially. Um, you know, there's there's a lot in the in the press about you know digital leaving people behind. You know, particularly those on low incomes, and um, you know the schemes that we administer would typically would would have people on quite low incomes as well. So we have to bear that in mind. Um, so I think we can do something. I think in one of our our early discussions, as we were preparing for this panel today, somebody described this as like whack a mole. Um, you know, is that if we get increasingly sophisticated, what we can do is everything in our power to make sure that we put the right money in the right account. What we can't do is what happens to that money when it once it's got there. You know? So that's when you know, you're gonna get people who increasingly, the criminals will, will find those areas of weakness and they'll keep moving around to where they can ex exploit people. And as Keith said, there's, there's so much money in it for them. Um, they'll just keep finding another way. And um, that's not to say that we shouldn't be doing what we can. and. I think we should adopt best practice um, as much as possible. As, a, as I say, and I'm being, I'm, I'm being honest as an administrator in, who, who operates in the public sector, there is not a bottomless pit of money to do these things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and quite often, a lot, of, a lot of the larger administrators like ourselves, we rely on software providers as well. Um, so sometimes our timelines are dictated by what's on their development roadmap and how much we can influence them to, to progress things. 
I, I, I was just going to say, and the same will apply in the private sector. Um, there isn't a bottomless pit of money. And unfortunately, we're in a scenario now where I think we just have to be clear. Pensions isn't core business. Money is being directed elsewhere. And as much as we'd like to spend all this money on protecting people, I think we just have to be honest that sometimes it's just not there. And we have to do whatever we can with whatever we've got. And we are running behind these very sophisticated people who are finding different ways of doing things every single day. Um, it is an incredibly difficult thing to, to address. Um, and I'd love to say, oh, yeah, and the answer is. But I don't think anybody can say, and the answer is. We just have to do the absolute best we can with the resources we've got and the reliance on, on third party suppliers to, to help us achieve that. I, I think I was just going to add that I think that's why forums like this are so important for sharing knowledge and looking at where we are, bringing in expertise from outside the industry. Uh, so, uh, uh, Joe, if I could come in at this point, I, I, just to follow on with Chris and, and Joe's part, sorry, Joe. Um, I think we will get hopefully better at ensuring that transferring money to individuals is as safe as possible. But I think, as Joe was suggesting, one of the problems we get is that criminals will just start to target not the transferring of the money, but the end destination point. So how do they defraud the person with the money that's in their account? They'll build the relationships with those people and the victims will just become a victim at the end point, as opposed to being a victim in a transference, if that makes sense. And it's one of the comments that I made at the beginning about having a better understanding of intrafamiliar fraud. I mean, we have very, very little understanding of how much of the pension money that is transferred to the right person is actually spent on that person and not siphoned off elsewhere. Yeah. Now, that may not be, in a sense, the responsibility of the pension administrators or the pension trustees, but it's an issue for society because it's actually, is the money going to the intended person for their use? And as Chris was talking about, you know, how do we ensure that people don't use lasting powers of attorney inappropriately? Or in my view, actually, you don't need a lasting power of attorney usually to defraud your own family member. You just go to your mum and say, sign a cheque, mum, and she signs it. And we have very little of an understanding of how often that goes on and what goes on. So I know in a sense it's not a, an issue for many people on this call today because you're in the business of transferring money safely, nationally or internationally. But all I'm saying is it's the whack-a-mole effect that Joe talked about. We lock down one area and the criminals will just move to another vulnerable point in the whole process. Yeah, and I think the more we understand that uh, the human response and the human relationships, whether it's within a family or, or in a community, the better we'll be equipped to handle that. Uh, maybe you can give us a, a little insight into what's going on to try to understand how much that's happening and what's and what's happening. I know you're involved in lots of research and advising government on that. So how much time and effort and expertise is going into trying to understand those relationships and that kind of fraud? Uh, in terms of understanding what's going on within fraud within families, I don't know of any national research at all, i.e. zero. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quite staggering. Um, it's worrying to me that the national expenditure in trading standards and trading standards officers, and let's be clear, it's usually trading standards officers that are involved in dealing with fraud. We spend about a half of what we spent 10 years ago. So in society, we've reduced the number of trading standards officers roughly by 50% in the last 10 years, even though we're all talking about this going up. Does that make sense? So. You know, we, we really do have to wake up to the fact that these are massive problems. And I think that it's, it's the loophole that the criminals are, are exploiting. It takes a long time for society in the state to change. You know, um, if I do watch TV, if I'm not watching Line of Duty and taking Joe's views about shotguns and whatever, um, the, all the other TV programmes seem to be called 
police interceptors or something like that, when policemen driving fast cars. Well, that isn't the big crime of today, is it? It's fraud. But police officers go into the police force to drive fast cars. And we need to understand that we need to have a new generation of police officer who's going in to protect vulnerable citizens. And, and that takes time. And because it takes so long, the criminals are just faster. And that's what we're going to have to get better at. And that's the advantage, I think, on the, the, the greatness of having uh, webinars and, and events like today, because it helps us bring together a broader understanding for us all to think, how can we put our tuppence within to try and make things better for the whole? Because we can't do this as individuals. We, it's no point in just little bits trying to change the system. We have to come together and share our various perspectives and come together with much more rounded and wholesome solutions. I think that's an excellent point. Uh, um, thank you, that, that's fantastic. Um, I'm also reminded, just talking about whack-a-mole and moving the crime from the point of setting up the payment to, to the end point, if we close it down here, it pops up here. I'm reminded of a, a chart that I saw about that chain of payment, particularly when you're paying overseas, that you have that problem of bank accounts being verified and a number of extra points along the journey that you wouldn't necessarily have if you're paying within the UK. And each of those points becomes a vulnerability. And one of the things that, among others, but one of the great advantages of, of eBRI is that it's removing links in the chain. You're pre-approving bank accounts so that it's trying not just to make each join in the chain more secure, it's trying to create a chain where there are fewer joins. Does, uh, how much is that something, I mean, it, it feels like something that um, we're less aware of because we're so used to the world of electronic banking where you press a button and money goes from here to there. That extra complication and the extra administration of money going overseas involves more risk so uh, joe that's a really good point that as you try and reduce the number of points you can make things smoother but but actually one of the problems at the moment outside of pensions that we have is actually the faster payment system so many criminals that win the confidence of their victims get them to transfer money and it's out the country within 30 seconds and one of the things I've been campaigning for for a while is actually, you know, specialist bank accounts that actually slow down that process. Many people realise half an hour afterwards they've been defrauded when they think about what's gone on. Yeah. But in a faster payment system, it's too late. You can't stop the transfer. So there are all sorts of ways that we need to think about how we can slow processes down, building text alert systems. Why is it so that, you know, your mother... Um, when a, an amount of money above a certain amount, why isn't there a text alert to the named relative or the, or the named person that she's named to say, does this look right and give enough time for the person to verify? There are better systems that we could build in to our total financial structure. And this is much outside of the world of pension now, but it's, it's, it's trying to get us to understand that we're locking down some bits. They're just criminals will move to other bits. And it's the totality. How do we run an electronic internet banking based system more effectively for societies and communities because if we're not careful it would be my view eventually that many people might start thinking forget it i'm never doing internet banking too risky i'm going to go back to old-fashioned checks just as we've gone to a cashless society because actually then i'm in control yeah i, I spoke to someone just yesterday who's struggling at the moment with a situation where their parents won't use a cash machine and goes into a bank and writes, I don't, didn't really know you could do this, writes a check to themselves to get cash out over the counter, some system which I assume was prevalent in the 1920s. No, 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 Joe, Joe, Joe. In my youth, that was the system. Before, before the cash machines in the world, you used to have to go to the bank on a Friday and there was always a queue, wasn't there, folks, at two o'clock on a Friday. Yeah when you were writing a check to yourself to get cash. And that's what you have to do. And you used to keep 10 pound note in your sock drawer, didn't you, in case you ran out of cash over the weekend. That was not that long ago. I'm not that old. Yeah, I, I feel I'm reliving my youth there. 
Um, but if if I can just pick up on on the point that was just made about you know the simple text message, can we can we stop this? I mean this this isn't something for the pensioners naive or the financially naive. I mean I I have a very good friend who some people on this call may know. I won't say who they are, um, but they discovered that money was being taken from their pension account because somebody had somehow hacked her email system. Um, sent an instruction to an IFA. The IFA received it, thought it was quite bona fide. And it was only because she's a pensions person. She checked her account and she saw that £40,000 was missing and was managed to stop it. Now, the simple question she asked the IFA was, why didn't you call me? Why didn't you ask? Why, why did you think I need that money? There are simple things we can do, but we're never going to beat a very sophisticated thing because there will always be a, a very sophisticated thing coming along but it comes back to my point the more layers that we can put in the the better and and i agree you know is is the instantaneous world that we live in probably the best thing for us sometimes it will be sometimes possibly may not i think that's a really that brings it to life and, and touches on one of the questions we had in advance from the audience. In fact, you may well have answered it already, but I'll ask it just to, to get it out there. I'm sorry, I don't have the name of the person who asked it, but they said, how are members of the panel, that's you, how are you securely identifying the non-digital members while still providing ease of access? And Joe, you talked about only 37% of uh, your members yeah, being... yeah what we do will be quite traditional so it will be two forms of id one that's uh, effectively id verification the other one that's proof of address so a utility bill etc um now the, the interesting thing is as more of the world goes online it's quite difficult to find a written document with proof of address these days <laughs> um yeah, but we we do that which is quite like i said that that's fairly standard um so i for, for me, you know, you, you won't solve this with one thing. You have to have a, a, a toolkit. You know, that includes your people being trained. You know, every single person in our organization has vulnerable customer training. They are, you know, including me. You know, we're all trained to recognize the signs of vulnerable customers and, and why is a vulnerable customer. Um, you know, it includes having digital tools that are, that are appropriate for what we do and that are clever. It, it has those, those more manual processes that we'll, we will still need, you know, whether we like it or not for a while. Um, and people just being savvy and going, something doesn't smell right, something doesn't feel right, you know, that instinct. It's going to be a combination of all those things. Andrew? Uh, I, uh, similar to Joe, we, we adopt some similar processes, but I think as well the... I think the item about the level of training and support that we give to the people that actually manage these processes for the members is hugely important. Um, I think the you know that weight of responsibility of they're not just defined benefit or defined contribution pension professionals these days. They've also they have to spot the signs, what to look for when something just doesn't look or feel right. And that's you know, and that's a really difficult thing, I think, to to, to really maintain the level that, that you need to be at. Um, I think too, we've you know, we quite rightly we've we've looked a lot at um, members being the victims. Um, but actually, I I wonder just sort of what the where we might go with the discussion, thinking about actually the members themselves could be defrauding the pension scheme, and in some instances. Now, actually, what about the people that are managing the processes and doing, perform, you know, performing the, the transactions? And so what can you do as an organization to make sure that you've got the right checks on your staff, the right training for your staff, segregation of roles, you know, independent audits, to make sure that actually the, the internal element of, of fraud is managed as well? I think that's a really good point. So you've got your organized, sophisticated gangs of criminals out there in the world funding all of the nasty things that, uh, that Keith mentioned. You've got uh, some opportunist fraud uh, from, a, from a member, perhaps not notifying the scheme of a, of a death. You've got intra-family fraud, someone trusting a family member where perhaps they shouldn't. Um, you've got bigamists. <laughs> Uh, or people you know, trying to claim for, for more than one 
benefit they're not entitled to. And that's an extra dimension as well, Andrew, making sure that your own internal system is set up. So thinking about every possible flavor of fraud and making sure you're set up to handle it. I'm going to turn to the other questions that we had before the session. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of this in advance, but just to put them in explicit question forms to make sure that any other points we want to get out there. And this one's about, it's from Stephen from the BBC. Uh, what do you think is appropriate in terms of balancing, verifying the identity and prompt processing of the payment requests, especially for overseas members, especially for members you might not have had any contact with for several years or members who, especially these days, expect an immediate service. There's always that balance, isn't there, between extra security and speed of service. Uh, Keith's already talked about bank accounts that slow down payments. What do you think is best practice in terms of balancing speed, convenience, and security? Um, for me, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, speed is important, and increasingly, with you know, demand for. I think rather than speed, I think that the demand from our customers is more about accessibility. Um, and actually, but overriding that, if your if your engagement with the members and your communications are right, the the pressure to pay quickly shouldn't really be an issue for you because it is the most important thing is about paying the right amount to the right place. And actually, as if you can be as prepared as you can be. The timing of that payment, you know, so for example, to coincide with employment income ending and retirement income starting, that really shouldn't be an issue. So speed is important, but not as important as sending it to the right place. Right. I, I agree, Andrew. Um, it's much easier to stop a payment than try to recover one. Um, you know, and you, you'll find that people are quite engaged in terms of wanting to verify their identity when when big payments are at, are at stake that's interesting yeah people i think people. this is right joe absolutely we, we everybody knows in society now that fraud's an issue we, there's, there's not a single person that doesn't get attacked by some fraudster at some point on your phone in the mail i think if we were able to say to people if we slowed things down there's a better protection system people would accept that so long as they understand what the process is and what the time level is and as joe and andrew said it's getting the right amount to the right person is slightly more important than is it going to be done within the next 30 minutes great uh, chris do you want to add a thought to to that i think they've covered that couldn't agree more <laughs> Couldn't agree more. I mean, I'd I'd quite happily have a conversation with a disgruntled person who was expecting the payment the day before, uh, rather than try and chase where that payment has gone to. Um, I think the disgruntled caller may well acknowledge and quite welcome the fact that we're carrying out as many checks as we possibly can. Um, that doesn't mean to say you should delay it unduly, but allowing time. I, I think is is an important thing, and I think it's appreciated, mainly. <laughs> great. I've got another great question. So many good questions coming in. Thank you, and apologies in advance if we don't get through them all. Andrew's asked, what have pension freedoms done for security and pension payments? <laughs> I did. <laughs> Well, whether you agree that pension freedoms is a good or bad thing, I don't know. Um, but at the point where the money leaves the scheme and goes to wherever it's going to, you've lost all control. You've lost all contact. Um, coming back to the psychological bit that's been that's been talked about before. I mean, most of these people, okay, prior to pandemic, most of these people have had the benefit of sitting with a potential fraudster either in a plush office or even on their own sofa in their own house. And they've, they've got it in their mind that this is the right thing to do. Nobody likes being told they're wrong. Nobody likes being told that perhaps they should rethink what they're doing. Um, and they're very keen for that money to go. And there are some very sad stories. Joe's mentioned some, and you know, I'm, I'm aware of some of, of people who have taken their money out with the view that they're going to get these fantastic returns. They just don't exist. I think pen, pension freedoms is yet another issue 
that we have to deal with. Um, but again, it comes back to the point of once that money is out and is away from from our our control, our, our interaction, what can we what can we as pensions people, what can we do? Um, I think that that comes to the actions of another regulator and, and what they should be doing to manage their their people. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether you're seeing the same as me, Andrew, but one of the other things, as well as obviously that, that increase in transfers over the years since, since Pension Freedoms was introduced, is what we're seeing now is, is, the, is the cases that are coming to us where increased numbers of subject access requests, increased numbers of claims from, you know, the, the claims companies have moved on from PPI now. The next thing is, were you, were you told to transfer your pension and, and, and ill-advised? Um, and, and a lot of these will predate, and quite a few of these predate my organisation. It's five, five years old. Some of them predate, but it still doesn't mean we don't have to do all the work, um, you know, to then go back. And of course, you know, the controls 10 years ago are not the same as the controls today. Um, so there's there's an invisible amount of work that we as administrators have to do now to almost start to try to pick the pieces up um, from those transfers that happened years ago. I think it's a real, a real unknown. And I guess it, it's it, it, it kind of makes makes me worry more because I, I don't know how big the unknown is and I don't know when when or if it might happen. But yeah, I, we see I've seen cases of you know where the decision at the time hasn't gone as expected, and the individuals concerned are, are looking for some sort of recompense or remediation. Uh, and and there are there are cases out there, aren't there, where they've, they've gone back to the trustees of the scheme asking whether or not did the trustees do the, do enough in terms of their responsibilities to make sure that they felt comfortable that the member was well informed to make to make that decision. And I think that's 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 a big, big topic that's, that could potentially emerge. Did we do enough? Yeah. Uh, we've just got five minutes and there's an area that has been mentioned, but we haven't dug into yet. What's the role of regulator here or, or legislation? What, what legislation would you like to see? What do you want to see uh, the regulators doing that would help you, that would help members? Or do you think that they've done that, is, that has not helped so far? <laughs> I'll make a comment, and even though I'm the most outside of this. Yeah. The, the problem with regulators and regulation is not the regulators and not the regulation. It's the enforcing of the good regulation and making sure it happens. So it's a bit like we set up frameworks of good practice of how to do things right. How do you make sure that most of the time people do the right thing in the right way at the right time? So we were just talking then about, you know, pension freedoms and pension fraud. You know, I, I, I have spoken to a South Wales steel worker who was advised to cash in his steel pension and to buy land in Australia that was desert. And what was the real tragedy was that because he was the foreman of a gang, of a team in the steelworks, all of his colleagues did the same thing. Because the foreman did it, they did it. And they've all lost the pension. And now he almost can't walk down the street in his own village because he feels so ashamed. But he was advised by a regulated or supposedly regulated pensions advisor. Does that make sense? So you can have the systems and the structures, but you've got to make sure people work to the systems and the regulations and the structures. And that's the hard bit. So I think we probably need to tweak things. We need to bring in more regulation in various areas. We need to have better systems and structures. But most fundamentally, whatever regulations we have, we need to make sure they're being used appropriately. And that's the weakness. Mm. I, th I think the reason we were all pausing was because that, that's a tough question. <laughs> um, it's certainly not a one size fits all. Um, you know, and I, I've said before, I, I think it's going to be a while before 
there'll, there'll be a, a certain proportion of, of members who will adopt digital tools and and the safety that that brings quickly and easily but there's going to be a tail you know where that doesn't happen um and we also need to make sure that we are not excluding people whether we're doing that consciously or subconsciously the reason I was pausing is I was going to answer, well, they should be doing more. But I was thinking about, well, what more what more should they do? And I think the enforcement bit is is a is a real thing. You know, that that's their big lever. That's the thing they should be doing. Are they doing it enough? Question. Andrew, thoughts on regulators and legislation? Well, it, it is it is just such a very difficult balance to to make, isn't it? Because you know we talked about pension freedoms and and actually pension freedoms for the members. This is this is their pension. This is their benefit. You know, you know they they should be entitled to have to have that benefit. And so, but with the introduction of something like pension freedoms, of course, that brings opportunity to the to those who want to exploit it. Uh, and I think you know, with what more kind of regulator do, you know, the the regulatory framework will effectively def define the benchmark. You know, de define the framework within which we all operate. You know, arguably those you know our, those people who are sophisticated will look at that framework and think, where are the vulnerable vulnerable points and where are the elements where actually I can just bypass it because. Actually, if everybody follows the same framework, everybody's doing exactly the same thing, um, because why would you do anything else? Then, you know, we're, we are all open in the same way. So I, th I think it's, I think greater enforcement is good. I think I'd like to, like to look at how we, without making it more difficult for members, we just we put in extra steps that we try and understand what they're doing and where they're going perhaps a bit more. And in perhaps as pensioners, you know, maybe we should be doing more with pensioners and staying in touch with them a little bit more. So that rather than just that first point of contact and then the setting up of the recurring payment and the once a year pension increase letter, maybe there's something more we could do there so that as that population is aging and arguably they come more lonely or more vulnerable, as Keith was, in, uh, was suggesting, that actually that's a way in which we can extend our duty of care. I think that's a wonderful note to end on. I'm afraid time has caught up with us, but it, I've learned a lot there. It sounds like if we use that, the wonderful tech tools to make the chain more secure that Ebri have given us, the ID tool that we've got for men, My Pensions ID, combined with that philosophy of building that relationship with the member, the human connection that Keith talked about at the beginning, more points of contact, thinking about that relationship of trust, uh, it's been really interesting. There is a consultation on scams going on right now, closing at midnight. I'm going to quickly put the link in the chat for you all. Uh, so if you've learned anything from today, you can check out that. Thank you, Ibri. Thank you, my pensions ID. Thank you, my wonderful panelists, Keith, Joe, Andrew, Chris. You've been absolutely fantastic. There's lots more to discuss. I'm sure you guys, I haven't checked this with you, but if uh, audience want to find you on LinkedIn and carry on the conversation, I think they should. And finally, thank you to all of you for dialing in and for staying with us. It's been really fantastic and very interesting for me. Thank you very much. Bye.